Why is that? Because he realizes that the one biggest challenge that people are going to face is just being able to get along with one another. I mean, look at the world around us today. It's so hard for people to get along with one another. We hear it in the news every day. Very recently, we were blasted with news from Charleston, what happened in this church, where a group of loving people invited welcomingly a stranger, and this guy comes and just shoots people around. Where is that hatred coming from? And just last week, we heard the Confederate flag was brought down, but people still said the flag may be down, but the hatred remains. Where is all this hatred coming from? Why is it that we just can't get along with one another? Have you ever thought about that? This is something that can't be fixed with laws or a new form of government. A systematic hatred that's built into the world around us. If it is, it shouldn't have taken this long to fix it, isn't it? Why is there so much of hatred? Why is it that we can't get along? It's because there's something beneath that. And if we even ask ourselves, maybe we are not that extreme, but we know that it's not easy even for us to get along with people, isn't it? Why is it we can't get along with people? Well, we may say, you know, we see things differently. We just have different perspectives, and our perspectives don't match, and so we don't get along. Seems like a plausible explanation at first glance. But is that it? Well, you dig a little deeper. Why is it that your, if your perspectives are different, you can't get along? Well, if our perspectives are different, we can't get along because I believe my perspective is the right one. And I believe my culture is the best culture. And therefore, you are always wrong. And so we can't get along. And why is it that we believe our perspective is always right, or our culture is always right. Because buried even beneath that is a sort of subtle self-centeredness, a selfishness you may call. We want to do what we think is right. Ego or selfishness. And that shows itself up. I mean, you see it everywhere. If you've been at work, when they put you in cross-functional teams to do a project together and say teamwork is our core value, it's a mantra in almost all of the world's top 100 companies. And you know what it's all about. Well, you've got to work in the team, but everyone's out there looking out for themselves. Yeah, I want to get this project done, but who gets the name at the end? It matters. And it's all cool as long as no one steps on your territory, your expertise and tries to tell you to do things differently. That's when we don't get along. Well, you're forced to because it's your work. Well, think about marriage. I mean, why is it so distant? Why is it? For those who have been married for a few years would be able to testify how it's, is it that easy to get along with our spouses? You know, the more time you spend with one another, the more the real person you see of each other and you start seeing the ugly side of one another and then it just gets hard. Or even if you're going to school, why is it that you can only hang out with a certain group of people? All the time? These are just my buddies. You know, I'm, I just can't fit with those guys. Sorry about that. Even we don't get along. <laughs> you know, the Bible has a word that it uses to capture that. It's not just us, you know, all the self-centered thinking, the self, me, I think, where it's coming from, it's, it's from our nature, and it calls it as sin. So it is in this context that Christ is praying for us. He's, he's praying that you and me will be different he wants to show the world that there's going to be a group of people who will come who can demonstrate that it's actually possible to love one another. And it's actually possible to be united despite our differences, whether it's our culture, our ethnicity, our values, our understanding of truth, 
He says, I'm gonna, I, I want to pray, God, that these people who are going to respond and come to know me are going to be different. They're going to show the world that it's possible to love and just be able to not just get along, but be united together. There are four things I want to quickly focus on today. First is the model of unity. Secondly, the means of this unity. Thirdly, the outcome or result of this unity. And finally, the future or goal of unity. You know, we can achieve this unity today as brothers and sisters, not because we have great programs or ideas, but you know why? It's because Jesus Christ prayed for it and he paid for it. We can actually be united in love, not because of our great ideas or new forms of government that we can come up with or make the society friendlier, but it's because of the power of the prayer of Jesus Christ and the power of his work on the cross. Amen? Amen. The model of unity. Where do we find this unity? You know, this thing sounds so surreal, so very idealistic. Who's there? Show me who does this, right? That's the first question that comes to our mind. And so in verse 21, as Jesus prays, he pours his heart out. He says that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us. You know, the world is looking for an alternative. It's looking for something that can inspire them to be able to break free from hatred. And here is where Jesus says, he says that they may all be one like us and with us. And he's presenting a model there. You know, the best model of perfect unity is found within the Trinity. Where there is a sense of selflessness between every single person of the Trinitarian God. There is God the Father. He says, you know, there is a selflessness. God the Father is always thinking and investing himself in Christ the Son. And Christ the Son is always wanting to think and do what God the Father does. They have a beautiful resonance there. And Christ is lost in the Father's self. And the Father is lost in the Christ's self. That there is no competition within the Trinity. Jesus is not trying to prove he's greater than God the Father, or God the Father is not trying to prove he's greater than Jesus. Very difficult for us to understand in the Bay Area, right? This is not the way you get into Ivy League schools. You gotta compete. You gotta assert yourself, right? But he says, look at this model. There's some selflessness there. And then he says, he's not just talking about this model where they are so beautifully selfless so that we can look at it, but he says he wants to bring us into that. He says that they may be with us. Now let's take a small digression here and ask ourselves a simple question. I don't know, when I was young in school, this was a question that kept coming to my mind. I'm sure some of you are thinking about this. Why did God create anything? Why did God have to create anything? You know, if God was just a one, one person, he was just a unitary God, and if he creates a legion of human beings and tells them, I want all of you to just worship me, that's a very narcissistic God to do that. But you see here in this picture, God is defined, the Christian understanding of God is that of a trinity, where God the Father loves Christ the Son, Christ the Son loves back God the Father, and the Spirit is the expression of his love. There is a beautiful self-containment. They don't need another relationship to give love or receive love. So why does God, the Trinitarian God, create humanity? And the only reason you can think of, and he talks about that is here, is he wants to share this beauty, this love, this glory with you and me. The selflessness is not just contained in the Trinity. He wants to spill it out to us and draw us into that same relationship. He wants to share the joy and the glory that existed within the Trinity with you and me. So well, that's attractive. And that's only going to be possible as we are united with Christ. And it is in that union that we can enjoy this bigger union and, and have an appreciation for that. 
The model of unity is the Trinity. The means of unity, verse 22, says the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. You know, the word glory is used 19 times in the Gospel of John, the most number of times in the New Testament. The only other place it's used that, without extreme is the book of Revelation. And, 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 the, and, and the Hebrew word understanding for glory is kabod, which means weight. You know, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to translate in English. It, it's, it's defined as the weight of the sum and essence of a person's characters. So when you talk of the glory of God, you're talking of the weight of all of God's attributes and characters that make him so awesome. And when you talk of the glory of Christ, we all know that there are two aspects to Christ's glory. There is a glory that Jesus Christ had before he entered into this world as a human being. It's called the pre-incarnate glory of Christ. But when he chose to come into the world, he left that glory and took upon humanity willingly. But here, what is very interesting is that Jesus says, the glory that you have given me now, I give to them. What is the weight of character of Christ that stands out in his life on earth? You know, when we think of glory, we think of some awesome, amazing things, you know, some dazzling display of power and majesty and, you know, magnificence. But what do you think was the most weighty thing that Christ did in his incarnate life when he was on earth? Yeah, he did some miracles, you know, he, the few people, gave us a glimpses of his power and how cool he is. Made some awesome speeches and, you know, brought some dead men alive. <laughs> but what was the most awesome, weightiest expression of the character of Christ? You know, the glory of Christ was seen, displayed to the entire humanity and the heavenly beings at, on the cross. The cross, the selfless, self-sacrificing nature of Christ displayed on the cross was the glory of Christ. And in that glory you see the selflessness that is, was so far only within the Trinity is now revealed in the cross. And Jesus says, I'm giving this to these people. You remember, he tells his disciples, if anyone wants to follow me, he must pick up his cross and deny himself and follow him. Unity cannot be experienced in a relationship where selflessness has not been experienced. And selflessness, the glory of selflessness is something that one goes to the cross to obtain and see. You know, John Flavel said the Father, Son, and the Spirit have been pouring love, joy, and glory into one another's hearts. And Christ reveals that for us on the cross. But our problem is, rather than glorying in selflessness, we glory in ourselves. You know, how do we draw our sense of glory? The reason we can't get along with one another is rather than thinking of glorifying the other person, we're always concerned about glorifying us. What's so weighty about me? You know, you, you want to express appreciation, especially if you're fallen in love or you, you know, are in a newly married relationship. You, you want to go and give your sense of appreciation to your, you know, you write some nice love notes and you say, darling or honey, you're beautiful, you're charming, you're adorable, you're so kind and cool. It starts changing after a few years. <laughs> but you see, you always remember that first love, how awesome it was when you were just pouring out appreciation for one another. Because at that time, you were not thinking about exalting and glorifying yourself. You were thinking about exalting and glorifying and saying nice things about this other person. And what was the result of that? Joy. Happiness. You see? But as time went on and you started withdrawing back and pulling back and when you started thinking all about yourself, the happiness, the joy also drifted away. 
Do we find glory in ourselves? That is our biggest problem. We, we try to find glory in our achievements. We try to find glory, we give more weight to the way we look, or not even that, to the way we think others look at how we look. And we give more weight to what we think others think about us. If that is what it is, if we are always so captivated by our you know, self-consciousness and are thinking about where am I finding my glory? It is so hard to love the other person. It's so hard to get along with someone. Because that's our idol. And we are going after these things that are giving us our self-worth and resulting in self-glorification rather than looking at others. But that is what Jesus does. You know, we may say, I believe in Jesus, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, but if I run my life, putting all my energy, and we do, into those things which we think are going to give us glory. Whether it's our achievements, or our job, our relationships, or our looks. Then we are still self-glorifying people. And, and, and really, we don't have this Christ in us, and, and, and it can't change. And, and, and so when that gets disrupted, it, the relationship takes a bit. And Christ is there on the cross. Not only did he first give away his glory when he entered humanity, and now he gives himself away as the ultimate expression of sacrifice for you and for me. I don't know if there are any NBA fans here, but the NBA Finals was a very exciting game. Any Warriors fans out here? You know, so the NBA Finals was a matchup between two teams. There was this one team, which I shall not name, <laughs> that believed in strength in numbers. And it had players who were willing to sacrifice their position and exalt the other players so as a team they could do well. And then there was this other team. <laughs> where one individual, whom I shall not name again, <laughs> was just glorifying himself. But it was just amazing to watch this team, even if you were not, this was not your home team. I had friends who were cheering for this team, because there was something beautiful. When, when, when you, even in a smaller fashion, this is displayed in a small group of selflessness for a bigger good, for a greater glory. It was just awesome to watch that. If only... Still don't get it. <laughs> if only we can change that and, and, and expand that into the world around us. And unless we stop glorifying ourselves, we can truly not be satisfied. If we are focused on our glory and the things that give us, it's not going to satisfy us. If we are seeking to find who is better than who in a relationship, we can't really experience true unity. It's funny, when we lose ourselves, we will find ourselves. Even in the Trinity, that is how it is. You go down to go up, and that's what the Trinity displays for us. And again, this is not something you and me can do by our own strength. It comes from this union with this Christ, and it is this Christ who lives in us as he lives his life out and helps us to move away from self-glorification to letting his life flow through us. And he spoke about that in this beautiful image of wine and the branches and says, without me you can do nothing. Rather than, lest we think with, okay, I got a new formula and I'm going to fix it. Now it makes sense. The model of unity is the trinity, the means of unity is the glory of the cross, the result of unity. Verse 23, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved them. world may believe that you have sent me. The result of unity is that it's going to be attractive to the world. And a group of people are actually able to get along 
when this life of Christ is lived out in their hearts. They forget who they are, how they look, where they come from, what are their achievements, what is their socioeconomic status. Because if they, they recognize, irrespective of the color of their skin, their hearts are all the same color, which is God. And they all need the same amount of the grace of God displayed on the cross. He doesn't ration it to different people groups. And once we recognize that it humbles us and helps us to freely love one another. And, and, and when we lose ourselves in that way by giving away our time, our money, our talents to meet the needs of those around us, we actually recognize and begin to experience true joy. We actually, that's, that's really when you experience true joy. And an outcome of that will be this unity in this relationship. How people look will no longer matter. What people think of us will no longer matter. We will begin to see what we can give in this relationship that we see. And, and you start seeing that in your own marriages to begin with, when we stop seeking our glory and being self-centered and really concerned about the glory of our spouse, we will experience better unity. And again, we can't do it by ourselves, and hence Christ wants us to remind us of our unity. And when we live like that as couples, as people, you know, things like what we are doing today, this is very attractive. I mean, try bringing a bunch of Asian people and Indian people and some Caucasian people together to have fun. How easy is that? Try it. But isn't it amazing that we can drop all of that and come together in a beautiful place like this and worship Christ because that's where we draw our glory. And God is so glorified when he sees things like this and it just warms his heart. And that's attractive to the world. The world needs this. The world desperately longs for this but just doesn't know how. And we are the agents to express this love of Christ, to point them to the cross and say, without the cross, this is not going to be possible. This is what the church ought to look like. This is how our marriages ought to look like. This is how our friendships ought to look like. And then we can be the light of the world. The future and goal of unity. Finally, verse 24, 26. It says, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. And verse 26, I made known to them your name and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. The future and goal of unity is that Christ is inviting us when we serve one another with life for us. We not only begin to experience a unity in our relationship right now, but we are drawn into an ultimate experience where Jesus prays, I want these people to come with me and see the glory I have in heaven. You know, this awesome uh, display of glorifying God, glorifying Father, glorifying the Son, Son, glorifying the Father, and enjoying this everlasting love. He wants us to be smack in the center of that relationship and just see how awesome it is. And that is just going to be amazing. I don't know what it is, but it's just going to be amazing. And that's the future of the unity, he says, when you're united here. And that is why he says heaven is going to look like that, where people from every tribe, tongue, and nation can gather together and not be focused about themselves, but be focused on this Christ and, and this love that is displayed so that we can let go of who we are and just be lost in this awesomeness of Trinitarian love that Christ is displaying and be able to praise and worship him. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that something to long for? And it's better that we start get, getting used to it right here on earth. And the ultimate outcome of God is going to happen again when we are united with Christ. You know, we live in California, it has a lot of redwood trees. You, any of you driven through the redwood forests or Muirwoods, San Francisco? And the first time I saw this, it was amazing. I've never seen such huge trees in my life. You know, the tallest tree I've seen was a coconut tree. 
<laughs> down in South Korea. It's like, wow, and, and they tell you that some of these trees were there for like a thousand years? Like, are you serious? But, but the redwoods, the manner in which they grow is very, very unique and unlike that of any other tree. So what they say is two trees of the species of redwood start growing up year after year, a few feet from each other. And finally, after some 50 or 100 years, the trees, as they grow, they begin to touch one another. And as soon as they touch one another, the barks begin to overlap and fill up. And from that point on, the two trees become just one. And then you just have one bark going all the way up. And if you go to Mirwitz, you can actually see there are like five or six trees that have grown together and they kind of form like a cathedral, like I think they call it the cathedral cone or something. And then from there on, they grow. So you can actually stand in the center of it in an imaginary bark, which doesn't exist. And then there are these huge redwoods that are standing on the shoulders of these. It's just an awesome display to see uh, how these trees are grown together. And as a body of Christ, and as you and me, we are born in different places, we are raised in different ways, we eat different food, you're going to check that out right now, <laughs> spicy food, hot food, plant food, all that. But then we meet at somewhere, at some point, and you know where we meet? We meet at the foot of the cross. And Christ unites us. And from then on, we grow as this one strong tree. Because of that tree on which Christ gave his life away. And when we get united with Christ, you know, his selfless love and life starts flowing into our relationships. So Paul is able to say, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live in my body, I live by faith in the Son of God who died for me and gave himself up for me. And that can be the very essence of our life as well. And the ultimate outcome of such a unity is love. The goal of unity is love. And that is what the world needs right now. And that is what our marriages need right now. And that is what our churches need right now. Think about the relationships in your life, starting with your loved ones at home, your friends at work, your neighbors, people you hang out with. Are you experiencing this joyful relationship? Are you able to get along? If not, ask yourself why. Why is it? Is this because I'm being so self-centric? Or is there something I'm thinking and constantly focusing on my glory? What is my glory that's driving me? Am I worried about my ego? What they said has made a dent in my glory? And look at Jesus, how his glory was displayed by giving everything up for me on the cross. What thought goes through your mind when you meet someone who doesn't look like you? So just plain indifference because they don't look like me or talk like me or eat like me? Maybe because I may be glorifying something else other than Christ. Christ left his glory he had in heaven and displayed another form of glory on the cross. And when we are united with Him, He's going to help us to display the same and enable us to get beyond all our barriers and seek meaningful relationships. And you'll be amazed to see how the world opens up to that. To see people who have nothing in common actually loving one another. And such a unity cannot be accomplished by our own efforts, except by our union with this Christ. And it's possible, not just because Christ paid for it, but he's also prayed for it, and he still today prays for you and me, sitting at the right hand of our Heavenly Father, still praying the same prayer for us, so that we can experience this awesome love in our relationships. The model of unity is Trinity, and the means of unity is the selfless glory of the cross. And the outcome of unity is missions and drawing others to Him. And the future and goal of unity is this unspeakable joy and love. And may that be yours and mine as we celebrate this morning.